Welcome to Good News Rhode Island, the show about Rhode Island and the people and places and events that make Rhode Island a great place to live, that build our communities. So many times these days people say to me, well, you know, I've just really gotten tired of listening to all the bad news. It seems to me that in Rhode Island we have a lot of good news and a lot of people working to make sure that our future is secure, that our future is sustainable, and that we have new ways of eating and thinking about our land and our seas. Today we have Sarah Schumann with us, who's here. She started a group called Eating with the Ecosystem. She is a model for us of the way we can get involved the way education happens from, with someone who is passionate about what she believes in. We look at the sea and we think it's infinite, it's deep, it's wide, we'll never get to know it all, it's mysterious, and the truth is the sea is changing because of what we eat or what we are served to eat by the, the market chains that we use when we, when we shop. So I want to welcome Sarah here. Thank you so much for what you're doing for New England, not just Rhode Island. You're based here in Rhode Island, but uh, you have a lot of interesting ideas about how to educate us all. So um, I'm anxious to talk about it. It's great to be here, thank you. Uh, Sarah, how did you get started in um, your interest in eating with the ecosystem? I've been involved in the fishing industry in various different ways for the past uh, decade. And um, I was involved with selling seafood at local farmers markets a few years back. And it astounded me how people would come up to our table, look at what we had, all the local species that we had, and then they would ask what was sustainable and pull out their smartphones and consult the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch app, which is a phone app that's developed um, by an aquarium in California that has a sort of red list, green list system of telling you what you should eat and what you should avoid. However, that app is really oriented towards the supermarket shopper, so part of the global um, seafood system. And what we had at our table at the farmer's markets was a completely different set of species. And it made me realize that there was a real disconnect between the local foods movement and this notion of sustainability. And that maybe there was an opportunity there to sort of recreate the notion of sustainability around our local places and our local seas. And that was the seed for eating with the ecosystem, which we call a place-based approach to sustainable seafood. So uh, place-based is meaning? Place-based means um, it's an, in opposition to uh, sort of a species-based. So for example, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch for, uh, smartphone app or the um, Marine, Marine Stewardship Council logo certification, which some people might be familiar with. It's a blue check mark. If you go to Whole Foods or Walmart, it's there on some of your seafood telling you that that's an approved species to eat. Those are um, systems that are based on the species. So they look at where a species or a stock of fish is compared to where it was before um, and make a determination about whether it, it needs uh, a market boost or the market needs to be 
So do it's it. it's based on the market, but it's not necessarily based on the it's not, well being well, of the ocean. What what it leaves out, and it's not a criticism. This is just because that's inserted into the global seafood market. It has no way of addressing some of the things that you can only address at the local level, and those are two components, broadly speaking. One is um, the relationships between everything in the ocean. So species don't exist in isolation. They're constantly interacting with all the other different species out there. And we need to take care of those relationships just as much as we need to take care of the individual species or stocks that we're fishing. And historically, those relationships have been ignored not only by the market, but also by fisheries management, which is only, fisheries science is only now developing the tools and the models that they need in order to be able to steward those relationships between species. The other thing that is left out of the global seafood uh, sustainability movement is the fact that sustainability of seafood has to do with a lot more than just what we buy and what we eat. Mm -hmm. It has to do with what we drive. It has to do with the chemicals we put on our lawns, the road salt that's going on our roads in winters like this one. Um, you know, our seas are, the water temperature is creeping up there. Um, waters are becoming more acidic. Um, there is an increasing interest in using our oceans for things other than fishing, like development of offshore energy sand and gravel mining mm -hmm. and all of those things, everything we use the ocean for and everything we do on land that runs downstream into the oceans has an effect on the ability of the oceans to produce our seafood for us. And you can only really start to consider your impacts on seafood when you're considering those, those impacts at a local level. So eating with the ecosystem, a place-based approach to sustainable seafood, creates communities at the local level around how to steward our entire ocean ecosystem for the benefit of, of seafood that we depend on and enjoy and that brings us closer to those ecosystems, builds a relationship not only between the people who are enjoying that seafood but also with the ocean that's producing it for us. You're passionate about this and you know about it firsthand because you have boots on the deck. You have been a fisherman for a long time in trying different kinds of species, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, what you fished for. Yeah, well, I started fishing um, about 10 years ago um, on lobster boats in Point Judith. Um, so I had that experience, you know, that was sort of lobster at that point was already dwindling in comparison to what it was 20 years ago. Um, by this point now, it's, uh, it's a much diminished shadow of what it was here in southern New England, and that's probably due in large part to those warming waters due to climate change. Um, but I've also, uh, I've had my own shellfish license now for several years, and I use that to mostly go shellfishing from shore, um, specialize in wild oysters, uh, razor clams, which a lot of people don't know you can eat, but they're really probably the best shellfish we have in Narragansett Bay. Um, quahogs, conks, so. So you've been watching the sea change essentially uh, over 10 years, and I bet it's, it's visible, the changes are visible. I would say from my perspective, I don't have the time series to be able to say, oh, here's a change, in particular because oceans are highly variable anyway, so you really need a long-term to look at historical long-term trends, you need to have been out there for a while to know that it's not just you know fluctuations in the environment which are natural. Um, but I've spoken with um, a number of fishermen down in Point Judith who have been fishing for you know 40 years, and they're definitely seeing changes. There's really no doubt in their minds that we're seeing a lot more warm water species up this way: um, garfish, cobia, spot croaker. Um, things that really never existed here, or if they did, there were just occasional strays from the south who got lost in the Gulf Stream, and now they're showing up you know, in considerable numbers. Um, crabs are becoming a big thing. They've basically replaced lobster for our lobster fleet. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing for the fishing fleet, as long as they have um, the ability to harvest those species and as long as there's a market for them. I mean, there's a broader question of whether it's ethical to change the oceans in that way, um, but in terms of the sustainability of our fishing fleet, it's good to have replacement species in the form of, of some of these new ones as long as we can give our fishing fleet the flexibility that they need to adapt to climate change. 
fishermen are very, very firmly affected by the climate change, which is um, a really uh, let's see, it's, it's almost like the agrarian culture. We're now seeing a change in fishing culture, which is part of our most ancient, I mean, our whole col our colonies up and down the East Coast were formed around fishing first. Yep. Um, so it's a really important industry to us. Um, as you have um, gone around and talked to people, you know that there are three major fishing areas um, in New England. I wonder if you might just talk about those for a minute. I know, uh, you know, we hear it um, viscerally, but now maybe you could tell us a little bit about each one of them. Yeah, and it sort of comes back to the notion of place-based. Um, so in, off of New England, there are three broad um, eco-regions or ecosystems. The Gulf of Maine up north, which borders um, Maine, New Hampshire, and um, Massachusetts Bay. George's Bank, which is offshore, sort of the submarine extension of Cape Cod. Um, and then Southern England Waters, which is, you know, south of, of Rhode Island here. And that's sort of an extension of the entire Mid-Atlantic Bight, which runs up and down the East Coast. There's a huge migratory pathway there for a lot of species that we um, were able to fish for them in the summer. And this time of the year, they might be down south where fishermen in the Carolinas are fishing for them. Um, a lot of people watch whales and become more aware of the ocean that way. Are, are you aware of, uh, do you know any patterns that are happening with the whales? Um, I don't know. Uh -huh, okay. No. We specialize in edible species. Yes, well, that's a good thing. I'm glad we're not eating any whale meat. Um, so you have decided, because of this passion and this knowledge, to kind of make a, a new I, I don't know, a new thing, which is to say education is the most important. And therefore, we are going to hire scientists or we're going to encourage scientists to give us information, but to work with fishermen. Now, this hadn't been done before, is that true? Scientists and fishermen actually work together quite a bit, um, contrary to the popular belief, which has that. Uh, you know, they can't even be in the same room without attacking one another. <laughs> That's a story that the press likes to put out there. Um, but in fact, there are many fishermen who work hand in hand with many scientists um, through collaborative research where scientists will contract with a fisherman and their boat to go out and do research, not from a research vessel, but turning the fishing vessel into a research vessel. Um, but what we've done is, I guess, bring together uh, fishermen and certain types of scientists and chefs, which is a, I think, unique recipe. So the types of <laughs> scientists that we work with are not your traditional stock assessment, um, you know, statistical analysts. Um, rather, they're the really forward-looking, out-of-the-box scientists that have a more ecological view of the ocean. And those perspectives are often not um, as central to the way that our fisheries are managed and it's our belief that they need to be. So fishermen who are examining the effect, I mean, the scientists who are examining the effects of climate change on our fisheries, ocean acidification, marshland loss, and who are trying to piece together a model of the food web so that helps us understand the importance of all those relationships in the, in the sea between fish species. Um, it, it may be surprising um, to some to hear that a lot of, there are a lot of unknowns still um, in terms of what we understand about the ocean that limit our ability to effectively manage our impact on it. Um, so we definitely want to encourage those types of forward-looking scientists, science that will uh, get us there. You were talking about chefs being part of that mix. Um, so for a while you hosted, um, what would it be, uh, chefs who were looking at different species of fish um, as they cooked in their restaurants. You hosted yeah. parties there, mm -hmm. what you called parties, but they were really information sessions. Yeah, it, educational events through food, so education through food, and the chefs were critical to that. I mean, obviously people come for the food, and we try to sneak in some education. So we hosted a traveling dinner series at various different restaurants here in Rhode Island, capitalizing on our amazing restaurant scene and our talented and forward-looking chefs. Um, each of those dinners, we would choose one of those three eco-regions that I mentioned before, the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's Bank, or Southern New England waters. We'd bring in a fisherman who fished in those waters and a scientist who was looking at those waters and trying to understand them in innovative ways. And then the chef would try to source as many um, as many different species that were in season in those waters as he could with an emphasis on things that people 
consumers were less familiar with, to expose them to those new but plentiful uh, species that are out there. Um, and so we would try to sort of recreate that ecosystem on the plate through the food prepared by the chef and the narration provided by the fishermen and the scientists who are intimate with that system in different ways. As the temperature changes of, say, the Gulf of Maine, fish move into those different areas and other fish cannot sustain themselves. Is that right? So basically what we have is a constantly changing system that needs constant study yeah. and uh, that probably needs constant new recipes, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, you also have a book group that you've started. I don't know how you would possibly do that as well as everything else, but how does the book group work? Well, um, last year was a great, book for, great year for books, in my opinion. We had a couple of excellent books come out um, this is an American Catch by author Paul Greenberg, who's based in New York and has made a career writing about fish and getting people to think in new ways about fish. Um, so what's interesting about this book is it encapsulates sort of half of our mission at Eating with the Ecosystem, which is that in order to steward our marine ecosystems, we need to be connected to them through food. And one of Greenberg's assertions is that America, by not being more of a seafood-eating nation, has more or less severed our dependence on our coasts, and that bodes very ill for our incentive to take care of the oceans, um, which is sort of half of our mission in a nutshell. So I was really excited when this book came out. Um, our other book that we're, we've been reading this winter is The Third Plate by Chef Dan Barber, who is based in New York as well. And this encapsulates sort of the other half of our mission at Eating with the Ecosystem, um, which is that food, you can't just evaluate the sustainability of a particular food item in isolation from everything that surrounded it when it was being produced. Food is part of a web of relationships in the field, because um, this is a, more of a land-based uh, treatise on food. Um, and it's just as true for the sea. You know, everything that we eat comes out of a productive web of relationships, and we can't evaluate its sustainability independently of that web. Um, so we've read both of these books. Um, the book club is in collaboration with the Young Farmer Network, which is a fantastic network of budding farmers in Rhode Island and southern New England. <clears throat> and we're going to have our last meeting of the book club in early April. And people can find out about that by um, liking us on Facebook, uh, Eating with the Ecosystem. And we'll post details. Okay, we should say you have a great website and it leads you to all kinds of things, including a TED talk that you did here in Providence, I guess, um, talking about this whole, um, this whole topic in a very succinct way. So I would <coughs> recommend that people would watch that as well. I was uh, listening to uh, a tape or a, a show on Lewis and Clark recently. And Lewis and Clark's men were starving as they came close to the coast, on the west coast. They were starving. And they were depending on horses or bison or whatever they could find because they could not eat fish. They were so acclimatized or so trained to eat only red meat that they could not eat the fish. And the, the streams were just, a of, you can imagine, you know, there was salmon and all, all kinds of fish, but they could not eat them. So I think that may say something about our history um, that we haven't understood uh, fish very well. Yeah. Um, um, so what, what is your next hope for your organization that you've started so creatively and uh, use so many different aspects of the culture for? Yeah, well, uh, we're hoping to rekindle our restaurant dinner series at some point soon. In the meantime, um, I'm working with a group of URI economic students um, to examine the feasibility of getting low-value, abundant local seafood into the food pantry distribution system in Rhode Island. Um, a lot of the seafood that's actually abundant and that suffers from a lack of market recognition is actually fairly affordable, which is good because, um, you know, at least in theory, that means we could use some of that in ways that feed the people who need it the most mm -hmm. here in our communities. Um, it, there's a lot of questions that remain about sort of the logistics and 
processing of that product in order to get it to the people who need it. Um, so that's what we're looking at. And that group of URI students is going by the name the Sea Robin Hoods, which is a very clever uh, title. Mm. The Sea Robin being one of our very abundant and very under-recognized local seafood species. It's actually quite delicious. Of course, it's good for you, but it's widely considered uh, something you throw back. Um, but we believe there is potential for that. Um, the other thing we have coming up, um, starting sometime late this spring, although we haven't set dates for it yet, is that we're going to be hosting uh, a workshop series at the new Hope and Main Kitchen Incubator in Warren, which is a wonderful facility that opened up just this year um, in an old schoolhouse in Warren to give space that um, start food startups can rent by the hour in order to get their business off the ground, whether it's making you know, their family's secret salsa recipe, taking that to a bigger scale and selling it at farmer's markets, um, or like us, you know, an educational group that we're going to come in and use their demonstration kitchen. We're going to bring in some of our most talented chefs in Rhode Island, um, starting with a chef who's on our board, Chef John Cambra. Um, and we're going to be teaching people how to use some of the fish they may not be familiar with or comfortable with preparing at home, including whole fish, because using whole fish is one way to minimize the waste and um, get the maximum value of the seafood we're extracting from the sea, and also to get closer with it and understand it um, you know, as, as a living uh, organism that had a history in an ecosystem, but that also provides food for us as living organisms in our ecosystem. So just a new way of connecting with food. So you're gonna have us all more educated about the sea and eventually. Um, you had told me that there are ways for people to volunteer. And one of the ways sounds very strange, and that is that you can use your dock or your, uh, your entrance to the sea as a place to grow oysters or to incubate oysters. Right, and I wonder if you could talk about that for a minute because it's very interesting. Yeah, it's a, that's not us. That's Roger Williams University that uh -huh. has a restoration project. Um, but I'll mention it because I think it's such a great idea. Yeah. Um, so Roger Williams has a program called OGRE, Oyster Gardening and Restoration, for Restoration and Enhancement, I think is what it stands for. And volunteer uh, property waterfront property owners can volunteer to become oyster gardeners for a season. So they get the oyster, um, you know, when it's very small, juvenile oyster, hang it in cages underneath their docks and just let them thrive in the water column. And they have to go out and shake them every now and again to, you know, get the debris out. Um, and then after a season, when they've grown to maturity where they become predator-proof, um, Raj Williams takes them and plants them um, in different parts of Narragansett Bay and the salt ponds uh, so that they can establish oyster reefs. Such an amazingly creative idea. I, I just think if you have a doc, please call Roger Williams University and try to find out more about it. Um, so what else can people do besides learning this basic material that's held in these books and the kinds of things that you're saying? Um, well, for eating with the ecosystem, restaurants can get in touch, chefs can get in touch if they're interested in hosting one of these events. Um, we're interested in doing maybe an international seafood festival at some point using local seafood, global recipes. One of the interesting things that I've learned by doing this is that you mentioned Americans were not a seafood nation, but a lot of other nations are. And mm -hmm. we really benefit from the presence of immigrant communities in our state. And we have a lot to learn from them about how to utilize our own local seafood. Um, because they know how to cook with a much wider variety of seafood, including whole fish. Um, so we'd like to bring together sort of the biodiversity of the ocean with the human diversity in our state and see what transpires. The, uh, the head and the tail of the fish is good broth, for one thing. But I can't think of other things to use it for. <laughs> Um, so you are you are now a 501c3, and you have a board. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just you working alone, That's but you're also looking for someone to help to administrate, um, and you're also looking for donations to help you to widen the uh, the audience that you have. We have so much that we could do if we if we had uh, the resources and the manpower. Um, we really plan to develop the science a little bit more. That's not necessarily cheap because you really need an expert. Um, my vision is to develop a local 
a balanced seafood diet. So actually taking um, the abundances of different species in our local ecosystem and kind of replicating that on our plates, similar to the way that the USDA food plate ha uh, says you 